I'm Liam Billingham. I'm George Fergopoulos. And this is Oeuvre Buster. Nice, Liam. Yeah, it was really clean. Yeah. Some of my best work. Usually we do seven or eight takes. We don't tell people that. But this one. <laughs> this is minute 50 of recording. Oh my guest is God. losing his mind. Welcome to Uber Busters Deep Dives by Dialectical Dudes. I'm going to keep trying to make alliteration happen. The t-shirts are out. Um, for those of you who have ordered them, they're in the mail. Um, but I did not know about that. Oh, no, oh, I'm just a little side hustle for me. <laughs> You're so cool. You're making money off of... Okay. There are dozens of listeners. Um, dozens? Hundreds, hundreds. You shouldn't say that you have a low listener count with with your guest on. Bill Gayabiri <laughs> is our guest this week. How are you, sir? I am good. How are you? Good. Thanks so much for being here and talking about this movie f- that we planned on doing months ago. So it's great <laughs> to finally, like, you know, pre-pandemic times, I feel like. Um, Bill Gayabiri is an editor and film critic at Vulture and is responsible for a bunch of writing that we really enjoy. So we're really happy to have you. And actually... When we were putting the season together, it was like, I'm going to email the Abiri and I'm not going to say that I want him to do high and low, but my hope is he will come back to me and say, I want to talk about high and low. And when you did, How I was interesting. like, oh, I don't know. I just thought it was a right. I thought it was a good fit. And, but I didn't want to be like, I want you to talk about this movie because there's so many good movies to talk about. Um, but why specifically do you think, did you pick high and low? And would love to hear a little bit about your relationship to Kurosawa in general. Um, I think, I mean, high and low is among my favorites of his, I would say, you know, I'm a boring person whose favorite Kurosawa movie will probably always be The Seven Samurai, but um, I think High and Low is right behind that. Um, my introduction to Kurosawa happened so long ago that I don't actually remember my first introduction to Kurosawa. Like, I remember, I mean, when I was a kid, I mean, I was a cinephile child of cinephiles, so I remember Ron coming out, you know, when I was wow. 10 or whatever, um, or 9. Um and I even remember vaguely Kagamusha. Um, so I've always kind of known about Kurosawa, and I, um, over the years, had had watched a lot of his films. Obviously, Seven Samurai I'd seen a bunch of times. Um, but my real kind of deep dive with Kurosawa happened, I guess, I think uh, 2010, mm. which is when, um, I mean, I had seen a number of the films by that point. I'd seen, I'd seen you know, most of the samurai films, obviously, you know, Hidden Fortress I'd seen being a Star Wars fan and all that. Um, but um, that was, I think, when Criterion put out it's this giant box set of Kurosawa films. And I mean, it was massive and expensive. And, and I, you know, I decided to write about it for, uh, I believe, Moving Image Source at the time, which was the Museum of the Moving Images uh. website that was edited by Dennis Lim and actually featured a lot of essays and things like that. And I wrote a bunch of things for them. But this was both an opportunity to kind of get into Kurosawa again and also, you know, basically to, to score a free, really expensive box set. <laughs> would probably <laughs> cost more than what they would have the what they paid me. We uh, constantly grift. beg criteria to let us into the, the closet. And yeah, they, we email them and we're like, we're going to do a Kurosawa season. Can we please I, have some I have, silence? I've never admitted this publicly, but I have been in the Criterion Closet. <gasps> What's um, it like? And I completely... First of all, it's smaller than you think, um, but I completely blanked. This is, like, among my <laughs> friends, this is, this is like, my great shame. I went into the Criterion Closet, and I completely blanked, and I walked away with two Costa Gavras DVDs. That's all I got. Um, now, part of, He's a good one. Now, part of it was I have a lot of the movies, so I was kind of like, oh, do, do I have this? I do, you know, and there were part of me that was like, just find the most expensive thing and sell it on yeah. eBay. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I was looking at the stuff and I was like, gosh, all this stuff. And But then I saw these two Costa Gavras movies that I didn't realize they had put out. And I was like, oh my God, you guys have, I think it was like the, the Confession and State of Siege. Um, Oh, those are rare ones, I feel yeah, like. Yeah, and I don't think I... I didn't know that they had put those out. I was all right, well, I'm taking these. Um, but, you know, there are so many other when, things I could have taken. Like the other, When was this, by the way? How long ago? Oh, gosh, this was... Two, actually, this was 2016. I'm going to tell you exactly okay. when it was. Um, I was there for a meeting. And uh, what's funny is, like, the other day I was... Um, I had to write something about Grand Illusion, and, um, and I was like, oh, yeah, Grand Illusion... 
you know, I'll pop it in and I'm like looking through my collection. I'm like, wait, I don't have Grand. Why don't I have Grand Illusion? Um, <laughs> like I could I should have just taken Criterion's <laughs> Criterion's out of print copy of Grand Illusion. Um, but anyway, That's I digress. Really, my uh, brief Grand Illusion story is walking out of seeing Grand Illusion in film form. And I think at George, I think I told you this and bumping almost bumping into Ethan Hawke and us making eye contact and him going, sup? And I was like, this is a very surreal New York City, New York City moment. I love that movie too. And I do not have it on. I would freak out if I went into the crate. I wouldn't know what to do either. I would have, I'd be like, "Mm, I can't, you guys don't have to give me these. I would, I would pull, I would do the Noah. I would take two of everything. (laughs) Well, it wasn't, um, you you know, like my, I was not expecting to be invited into the collection. Yeah. I just, I, I had gone there for a meeting about something, or maybe I was interviewing somebody. I can't remember. Um, and just as, as we were walking out, Peter Becker's like, Hey, take Bilga into the closet. Wow. And I was like, wait, what? No. Um, so intimidating. but, but, but I digressed because what, so, so I got the box set and then I, I methodically went through the whole series of films and that the box set doesn't have all his films. Um, but it has, you know, the vast majority of them. Um, and it was great. I mean, I, I went through it. I, I believe I went through them in order. Um, that's also when I read or reread a lot of the uh, Kurosawa stuff I had. And, you know, it was like it was like doing a whole semester on Kurosawa in my basement. Um, and it was it was really eye opening. That was actually, I think, when I first saw High and Low. Um, and. But, you know, also the first time I saw, like, The Bad Sleep Well, um, you know, any number of the films. And it was really, you know, it, it was it's one of the, the great movie going, quote unquote, experiences of my life, even though I wasn't going anywhere. I was just staying at home um, and really um, watching all the films together. You really do get a sense of the themes that run through them. And it's really surprising how consistently he was how consistent he was in hitting some of the same ideas, but also how those ideas kind of changed over the course of his career. Um, So it was really, it was, it was lovely. And, um, and since then I've revisited high and low several times. um, And it's, he's so, he's so famous for the samurai movies. And yet here is this just incredible crime epic that is probably as influential in its own way as the seven samurai or Yojimbo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like a, a yeah. We'll we'll definitely dig into that, and also nice and a good opportunity because we're coming to the end of this season, which has been you know focused on Mifune and Kurosawa to kind of reflect on all these movies because it's like there's a couple things that are interesting about the casting in this movie that makes you think about the future of Kurosawa's movies. Um, George, tell us what High and Low is about. High and Low, or Heaven and Hell, which is a more accurate literal translation of that Japanese title, tells the story of one Kingo Gondo, a wealthy shoe executive who's the target of a kidnapping scheme. At the start of the film, Gondo is attempting a leveraged buyout of National Shoes, the company he works for, where he's an executive at, basically putting everything he has on the line in order to become president of the company. However, at the same time, a kidnapper has attempted to kidnap his child, but he instead accidentally kidnaps the child of a Gondo's sh- chauffeur. Gondo is asked to pay the child's ransom regardless, which puts him in, imp- in an impossible situation because of the fact that all of his money is tied up in this corporate takeover attempt. Film then turns into a police procedural as the cops slowly and carefully try to find the kidnapper, and eventually they succeed. Uh, the film ends with us learning that Gondo has, in fact, lost pretty much everything, although he does somewhat land on his feet by getting a new job in a smaller shoe company. We are then given one final confrontation between Gondo and the kidnapper, Takauchi, in jail, and we find out that Takauchi will be given the death penalty, and that's where the film ends. And some stuff obviously happens in the middle. <laughs> Some more stuff that I did not get to. It's a it's a great one act play that becomes the greatest uh, police procedural <laughs> of all time. Um, the movie was directed, produced, and edited by Akira Kurosawa. The screenplay was by Akira Kurosawa, Ryozo Kukushima, Hideo Agone, and Ijiro Hisata. Hisata. Um, literally, these guys have appeared in the names of screenplays for every movie we've talked. The, probably the last ten movies. It's based on King's Ransom by Ed McBain, which is an eighty seventh precinct book. Have either of you guys read it? Not no. No, I was going to ask if you had. I am. I started it, and one of the things that's interesting about it is how 
well, we'll talk about some of the differences, but a huge difference is that it has a much more optimistic ending from what I understand. And it's detailed in the Stephen Prince commentary track on the Criterion. Have you seen the, I guess there was a TV adaptation of the 87th Precinct novels, and this was one of the ones that they did, right? Yeah, it was one of the ones they did. And I have not seen it. I think it's pretty tricky to track down, but I could be wrong about that. Um, but it's really interesting. When and was the series I, made? I think like sixties, like, right? Or seventies. Yeah, it was made. It was made around the same time. I mean, the book came out. I think in fifty. This movie's sixty three. The book is like only a couple of years before. It's actually an interesting um, example of how how contemporary Kurosawa was with some of the things he wanted to do because. It wasn't like this was, you know, like a seminon novel or a or a or a Japanese samurai story that'd been around for a long time. This or book Shakespeare, was like basically, yeah. yeah, yeah. This book was basically new. The music by was is by was by Masaru Sato. The cinematography is Azakazu Nakai and Taiko Sato, which is really significant because they were also operating the A and B cameras in that opening. Mm-hmm. sequence. Um, the cast. I'm gonna look, focus on the folks who are regulars in Kurosawa because I think there's a lot of interesting things going on with the casting. Toshiro Mufune plays King Gogondo. Tatsuya Nakadai plays Inspector Tokura. Um, in what I think is my favorite performance in the movie, Kenjiro Ishiyama plays Chief Detective Bosun Taguchi. Um, Kyoko Kagawa from Lower Depths and Bad Sleep Well plays Raiko Gondo. Tatsuya Mihashi, also from The Bad Sleep Well, played Kyogo Kagawa's brother in that film, um, appears as Kanawisha. Uh, Isao Kimura as Detective Arai. Isao Kimura was the villain in Stray Dog and also the young samurai in The Seven Samurai. So it's interesting to see him in this film. Um, in a brief role, Minoru Chiaki plays a reporter at the press conference. Minoru Chiaki is in basically every Kurosawa movie before this. And Ijiro Tono, probably most famous as the innkeeper in Yojimbo, plays the factory worker who's interviewed briefly in the film. And of course, kind of amazingly, Takashi Shimura and Susumu Fujita play like a very small but significant role in this movie that I definitely think we should talk about. A um, couple facts about production. As is usual, starting with his work in Throne of Blood, Kurosawa shot multiple angles at once, especially in the opening scene. This thing was staged like a play. The camera moves were perfectly timed with the actors. He knew where the cuts were, and Kurosawa did extensive camera and actor blocking rehearsals. Um, there's even moments where you might not notice it, but he cuts between... The cameras are so seamlessly timed that there's a cut that you won't even notice. It's like unbelievable. Prince's um, analysis of the, a lot of those cuts is incredible. Yep, especially you know, what it means in terms yeah. of collective collective and individual roles yeah. of society and stuff like that. Um, and we can definitely talk about that. This film was influenced by a series of child kidnappings and murders in early 60s Japan, and Kurosawa thought the kidnapping laws were too lenient. A miniature of Yokohama with working lights and a train was built for the Toho set in Tokyo, which you only will notice if you know that. If you know that and then you watch it, you're like, wait, it's incredible. Um, The train sequence was shot on a six-hour trip to Osaka. Everything could only be shot once to meet the timing of the bridge, and so each actor had multiple cameras following him, the result being that the entire Toho camera department worked on that sequence. And they had to go back and reshoot after one because one of the cameras jammed. Yeah. And then this is something I did not know. There was a version planned in the early 90s to be written by David Mamet, directed by Martin Scorsese, (laughs) and apparently starring Steve Martin. Incredible. This whole thing with Steve Martin taking really unlikely roles in auteur projects, none of which ever came to fruition. (laughs) Like, the idea that he was supposed to be in Eyes Wide Shut. Like, there was this period when people just thought, hey, Steve Martin, why not? I guess he is in um, Spanish Prisoner, which is also Mammoth. But um, oh, that's yeah. right. I like that movie a Great lot. Movie, actually, yeah. I haven't seen Great. it in a long, long time. Yeah, I just this is such like a pipe dream kind of thing that it's almost better that it doesn't exist as much as I sort of wish that it existed. Like the idea of Martin Scorsese remaking this Kurosawa film would be nuts. well. At the same time, though, given all the other Kurosawa films that have been remade. Um, I, I recently rewatched, um, or not not rewatched. I recently watched the Outrage Martin Ritz remake of um, mm-hmm. Rashomon, and uh, and it's such a 
just a ridiculous movie. I mean, it's so crazy faithful, <laughs> even though it's a Western. Um, th th but but given all the um, remakes that have been made, I'm surprised that High and Low has not had an American remake because mm -hmm. of, in some ways it seems like it would, you know, it would be a no-brainer to to, yeah. to do that one. Yeah, and there's so much thematically that's resonant about the film now that I feel like would play incredibly well, like at yeah. this exact moment. Um, Bilge, you say this is one of your favorite Kurosawa films. I, I totally am with you on seven. It's hard not to say seven samurai, but this certainly sure. comes close. So what is it about this film that ranks so high for you? I mean, part of it is that it still to me feels so fresh. I mean, they all feel fresh in their own way, but this one, you know, you, you pop it in and you're just, you're just immediately gripped by it. And it just doesn't let go. I mean, until the final shot, which is amazing, it just doesn't let go. And I find that, um, I find that first of all, just technically incredibly impressive, um, but also the way in which it kind of shape shifts, where it goes from this like chamber piece, which is very riveting, um, and then becomes this procedural, I mean, but then also a journey through, you know, the quote unquote lower depths, if you will. Um, I mean, it's kind of, it has all of his obsessions and his, and his fascinations. Um, and yet at the same time, it's so seamless. Uh, and also the fact that it's, I mean, you know, the fact that he's adapting it from, and, you know, an Ed, Ed McBain novel. Now with, um, with Yojimbo, I think, you know, there was always this sense, I don't know if it's ever been actually acknowledged that he was adapting Red Harvest, but, mm -hmm. um, so like pulp is in Kurosawa's blood, <laughs> you know, like, like crime drama, crime thrillers are kind of in his blood. And, and here he is just making pretty much, you know, one of the, one of the great, you know, one of the best ones ever. And yeah, and also just the fact that, you know, the gang's all here. I mean, you just, you just listed all the, <laughs> all the people like that show up. It's the greatest hits collection. Yeah. It, it's weird in terms of, uh, you know, I, I know that among Kurosawa scholars, Redbeard is kind of considered sort of this like high point ultimate Kurosawa film. And I like Redbeard, but to me in some ways, High and Low is that movie. I guess High and Low is the film he does right before Redbeard. I mean, this is the this is the film where his obsessiveness, and I'm like his literal OCD way mm -hmm. of making these movies, is kind of has has reached its its sort of peak perfection. Mm -hmm. Like after this, it gets a little crazy, <laughs> um, but this is the point at which it it really pays off. Where his where his obsessiveness and his attention to detail and his willingness to just get it right at all costs, I think really pays off. And it's good. And it's filled with like these lovely poetic touches, like the, you yeah. know, the, the pink smoke, all these little like mm -hmm. formal elements that are just like thrown in as grace notes. Oh, by the way, here's another awesome thing this movie is doing that you can talk about for a little bit. I mean, it's just like every, every 10 or 15 minutes, it's, it's throwing something new at you. Even just that that wipe when when the train when you know when the train sequence first starts, like right there, you know, it's just a simple wipe, and yet it's so electrifying that yeah. You know, every time I watch the film, I'm like re I get really excited when I know it's coming. You know? Yeah, yeah. I think you know, there's a lot. There's so much. We're, we could do this for six hours because there's so much <laughs> to talk about with this movie. But I think the thing that if there's a moment that encapsulates how well crafted i think this movie is it's the cut and there's a million of them but there's the cut about i think it's right before the train sequence where there is the scene where you start to hear what the plan is then it cuts to the detectives reviewing the tape of the kidnapper saying what to do and you have um mifune in the background who, who doing whatever he's doing and then he gets up and he gets out his toolkit and this whole sequence that you know ends in the moving to that wipe that you're talking about is a five minute single take. And in the commentary track, Prince talks about how it's like maybe the greatest single take in Kurosawa's entire filmography, which is like saying something when you think about the fact that he burned down a temple in a single shot in Ron, like it's just, it, it feels to me like the ultimate expression of like 
yeah, his anxieties and his tensions and the things he was concerned about. And I also think that I saw this film, I think the first time around when Inception came out. And I remember mm. thinking like, man, I Nolan has got to be a Kurosawa fan because of just the, the, the formal elements, the suits, the way it's all composed, the like effortless, cool and male angst that's present in this movie feels like undeniably uh, influential on like Michael Mann on Nolan. George was going to laugh because he knew I was going to bring this up on Zodiac, the procedural Zodiac. elements. Yeah. Uh, you know, it just feels, it feels I had the over under 15 <laughs> minutes. So <laughs> we're at, damn it. We're at 15 minutes. No, that's incredible. Yeah. I would have taken, uh, I would have taken under too. And I think we went, over um, but you minutes. can just feel the, how much this movie dictates so much of what comes later with so many monumental filmmakers i feel like i'm surprised also in the notes that you didn't say like parasite or uh, bong joon ho especially with with the way in which the house becomes a symbol mm. of mm. his wealth and it becomes a character all uh, of its own yeah i mean just that because I, I know you've been i know that we've been talking about that film well, a it lot comes up in the context of these a lot of these kurosawa movies and also the significance of the chauffeur as a symbol of some kind of status yeah from both sides of it which we can definitely dig into yeah i love this movie i've said i've been saying that since the beginning like the beginning of the podcast it was like let's talk about sanjiro sugata and i was like no let's talk about high and low because it's the greatest <laughs> george what do you think i think it was your first time seeing it it was my first Philistine. time seeing it yeah and i gotta say I swear I'm not coming. I'm not trying to no hot takes here. But first and foremost, let's be clear. I really enjoyed this uh -oh. film. I thought it was great. Podcast canceled. But he, <laughs> but there was something. I just I don't know, man. Like the uh, up until the first 45, 50 minutes of it, just felt weird, weirdly like expositiony to me. If something maybe with the maybe it was a the screenplay, there was a lot of like. Just it seemed like a necessary kind of dialogue in regards to like what was happening, what was happening in the moment, and obviously the visual elements are really powerful and so eloquently done. But something about that just was like I don't know, it just maybe it was also just kind of the mood I was in. But once it gets on the train and from that moment on, and when it turns into a police procedural, I was totally, totally taken by it. And obviously, I realized that the symmetry of it, the literal high and low aspects of it, are essential to what the film is trying to say. So I'm not like trying to say like, oh yeah, no, the film just should have started on the train and that's it. Like I understand that there's a formal structure here that Kurosawa was um, working through, obviously, th and how that relates to the, the thematic issues in the film as well. But yeah, just the f it, it, for me, the first 45, 50 minutes of it, the chamber piece of it, did not kind of just captivate me the way the second half of the film did. And also, like there was no. I, I just and again, maybe this is just kind of me nitpicking, but isn't it also kind of a bit ridiculous that the crime is committed on the very very night in which he attempts this leverage buyout like i thought the whole thing was going to be that obviously was some sort of kind of insider plot and did i miss oh. something because it's not right it's yeah. just a total coincidence i think it's it's just a coincidence i mean the thing they say about this type of story is you can get away with a coincidence if you you know if you put it right at the top of your story mm -hmm. like you can't get away with a coincidence if it comes like a, in the middle of the story or god forbid at the end but if you kind mm -hmm. of if if it comes right at the beginning, then you know th that's why it's a story because there was this crazy coincidence, and you know, yeah. so that doesn't that doesn't bother me. But I I know what you mean about that. Yeah, I think the podcast yeah, is canceled actually. So you guys have canceled it. Yeah, last episode. <laughs> but I do. But I will say this though: I do think also it's incredible the way in which the film takes us away from Gondo as a character because by the end, by like halfway through the film, he's pretty much like completely and utterly in the background, and then it becomes all about like these cops attempting to find uh the kidnapper and we didn't mention the kidnapper the the actor right yes uh, tatsumi tatsumo uh yamazaki who's incredible. incredible actor and would appear in later yeah. more kurosawa films after this one he's amazing. and is heavily featured in the extras he has a long interview on the criterion channel that is definitely worth and, checking out and Stuart galbraith's book the emperor and the yes. wolf details how completely and utterly terrified he was auditioning for the role yep it's a really yeah yeah um, but no, this film, I mean, this film is, it's, a, it's an amazing film. And obviously, if you haven't seen it, go out and watch it right now. Just don't go to the movie theaters, obviously, because there's a play going on. <laughs> One of the things that your thought did, that what you just said inspired in me, which, by the way, you're wrong, is that there, the coincidence of this thing, which I don't think about either, because I think Bill is right, I don't think that, I think it happens so fast that you're like, oh, man. But it feels like one of the things that works so well about this movie is the emphasis on 
um, Gondo as a character and the tragic implications of the story, I feel I feel like that coincidence because Kurosawa has so successfully operated as a guy making films like Stray Dog before, which is a noir about, you know, Japan. And then he makes Seven Samurai. And then he makes these Shakespearean epics, you know, Throne of Blood, whatever. It almost is like a fusion of those two in the character study that that we get of Gondo in the film. It's pretty amazing that you could argue that this film is a character study despite leaving its protagonist for 90 minutes in the film. Well, but part of it is also... In many ways, that second half of the film winds up being about the kidnapper, even though we don't we only yeah. see him in glimpses. But what's happening is, is you know, the cops trying to piece together all this all this information to come up with a, a portrait of the kidnapper. So, I mean, and, and this, you know, this bifurcation happens a lot in Kurosawa's films of you know characters and their mirrors or their opposites. And there's also a lot of role play that happens in his films, characters assuming the roles of other mm-hmm. other people. And I mean, this is, you know, you, say, you that doesn't happen so much in this movie, but, you know, you see it in Kagamusha, you know, you see it in um, Tiger's Tale and all that. But um, so in a weird way, I find it very poignant that, you know, Kingo Gondo, this, you know, industrialist, powerful industrialist, you know, seizes the frame in the first half of this movie so much so that you know the entire first 40 minutes or whatever takes place like in his living room um and when it you know and he like he's a protagonist right he's a he's a classic you know a a protagonist of the post-war boom and then when it switches to the other guy who was basically a victim of post-war japan um, and, and, you know, there, I mean, that is clarified in the, in the final scene, um, of the film, which is kind of like, you know, stray dog, you know, condensed into one mm-hmm. scene. Um, mm-hmm. but in the second half, when it becomes about the kidnapper, he doesn't command the screen. He is, he's almost invisible. He's like the invisible man who we only have little glimpses and little clues and little bits and pieces of who he is, as well as the people he he's with, you know, the addicts who we never actually see them as people. We just see them as corpses. Like there's something very poignant about that, that they never get to seize control of the screen and the frame the way, you know, big, strong Kingo Gondo played by Toshiro Mifune yeah. gets to, you know. And the kidnapper almost has no dialogue at yeah. all. Yeah. So the silence. I mean, he is tries to laugh resonant. and he goes insane, and then the movie's over. I mean, yeah. what a crazy way it's to end so the film. Cool. And also, the I don't know if you guys know, know this, but the lights made that cage hot. So when he grabbed it, he burned oh, his yeah. hands. So the <gasps> scream is an authentic, like he had oh no idea God. it was hot because there's oh, weirdly wow. an interview with Michael Sarah on the Criterion disc. Where, because he loves his movie. Sure, why not? And, and, right? It's like from <laughs> Michael said, why not? Scott Pilgrim, high and low, same thing. But he literally <laughs> goes at one point, like, yeah, I think it was electrified. And I was like, there's no way it was electrified. Like, what are you talking And then you look it up and you realize it's the lights. The lights made it hot all day. And that was the last thing they shot. So he burns his hands oh grabbing that Whoa. cage, which is awful, but a, a terrible, happy accident for the film to I mean to if it happened now Kurosawa would be like canceled oh, done. <laughs> and there would be like a be you know several daily beast articles about this but um <laughs> but uh but you know it happens in 1963 all all it is is great cinema yeah, he would be canceled for a lot of other things maybe before well, yeah this true <laughs> his onset yeah. attitude um yeah. I think it's an interesting moment to talk like when we think about who commands the frame about Mufune's performance in this movie because to me it is like there's it's almost absent the Mufune ticks. So when the Mufune ticks mm-hmm. appear they're like unbelievable. So let's I'd love to hear what you guys think about Mufune in this movie. And then it's I think a good chance to talk about the other leading men who appear in this film. Bill Gay, what do you think? What how does Mufune well, play I- for you in this one? Well, he plays great. Yeah. <laughs> He's Mufune. Yeah. He's great. Uh, <laughs> no, but this, the thing that the thing that struck me um, on this most recent rewatch is, um, you know, it, the the dialogue in that early scene. And, and George, maybe this is kind of what you're what you were getting at as well. Some of it is so expository. You know, like the, yeah. with, with him and the with him and the um, the other sh- you know shoe company guys. 
you know, everybody's, you know, everybody's making sure to tell the other person what their position, you know, you, you are the factory head of this shoe company. Yeah. And it's like, yes, we know, like, that's not how human beings talk. That's, but that it is how they talk in the movies. And, you know, certainly in 1963, the, you know, Basil Exposition hadn't appeared yet, <laughs> so people right. were less aware of that. But the thing is, Mifune is so good at selling all that stuff. Like, it doesn't bother me at all because he is so energetic and so, you know, so, such a great presence. Um, and also, and this is, a, this is a thing that I don't quite catch. I mean, I, I, I catch it insofar as the whole Mifune effect is certainly a thing. And we bring to him, I mean, because he is a movie star, we bring to him all these associations with mm -hmm. other films we've seen him in. But, and this is something that Galbraith talks about in his book, but, you know, his his very rough way of speaking, his, his very rough features, this is crazy. And they talk about his, like, rough peasant like features and i'm like i don't know what that means this is this is the most beautiful man in existence he's got the most delicate cheekbones i've ever seen i was this rough uh you know um but but uh, you know I have to take the scholar's word for it but they talk about how you know his his affect is very much not that of an upper crust privileged mm -hmm. um wealthy industrialist there is something very sort of rough to him um so that you know, just by virtue of his presence, he suggests um, a tough background. I mean, we hear about that later in the film. So, so, uh, but, but like, just even by virtue of the fact that he's Mifune doing his Mifune thing, you know, people would just bring all these associations to him, which I think is fascinating because that's only hinted at a little bit in the film. But I think it's central to this, what I think is this duality between the kidnapper and and Gondo is basically two people who could have become the same person, but you know their 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 roles were were you know were bifurcated you mm -hmm. know after the war. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, it's a very chameleon like performance. Again, he kind of inhabits again, which he's just so good at doing. He inhabits the kind of genteel bourgeoisie like frumpiness of the character. Um, like he's kind of just. Again, he inhabits that role in like an incredible way. It actually kind of reminded me a little bit of, um, geez, Liam, I'm drawing a blank. What was the uh, the film in which he's terrified of nuclear war? I live in fear. Yeah. I live in fear. Yeah, it reminded me of that kind of performance in the sense of how he kind of completely inhabits this character. And at the beginning, you're like, oh yeah, like that's obviously Mufuni, but also it kind of doesn't look like typical Mufune. There's also something about his his physic his physicality being more restrained, but powerful in a way that, you know, he's not, he's not flailing around. There's more of the Yojimbo than there is the Kikushima character in, in this, the sort of like back on his heels, confident kind of thing. But it's also, it's the haircut. It's the short haircut. It's like the relative cleanness of his, of his face. And also I sort of wonder if like, Kurosawa was like, hey, gain like 10 pounds. Just like put on a few indust wealthy industrialist pounds because he just, he inhabits that body in such like a, such a, such a spectacular way that you feel like you're watching someone who, who fits in. But I think that one of the things that's interesting about his sort of middle class looks, which must have been, meant something very different to people in Japan in 1963 than it would now, is that you also believe him as the guy who's like, yeah, get my toolkit. And you believe him as the guy who yeah. is like, you know what? I don't have to live opulently. I can, you know, I can live a more normal life. So there's something of a downfall in what, what the character experiences. And you believe him as someone who is able at the end of the film to go like, you believe that he's changed and he's become not the guy at the beginning who's like, it's important to be an individualist. And like, you know, June, shoot, shoot the bandit because you're in it for yourself. Well, and also he's... You know, he's very much a, a an odd man out at the beginning of the film. Mm -hmm. I mean, in in so far as obviously, you know, you know, he he's a hot shot at this company, but he is, I mean, kind of like um, Yojimbo, you know, playing both sides against each other, right? I mean, he is, you know, he's basically screwing over everybody else in the company to to, mm -hmm. to you know basically take the whole thing over, and and because of what we just talked about in terms of kind of Mifune's presence, 
we we buy that this is a guy who you know kind of got here on his own doesn't feel indebted to anybody and does not have any qualms about just like trampling the people mm -hmm. around him that that work for him um in order to kind of establish further control of this company um but what happens later is you know i mean this also speaks to what, what george was talking about how you know mifune kind of disappears from the movie sort of um you know basically he's saved by all these other people working together like this this mm -hmm. rugged individualist suddenly needs all these all the institutions of society and the goodwill of the populace um you know from the lowest rungs of society um to basically as well as the press to which seems a little unfair but in many ways it's a, it's symbolic of the fact that he, he can't do this alone mm -hmm. he is absolutely indebted to all these other people um and you know i i find that touching as well and also very um you know very meaningful in terms of i think what Kurosawa was trying to say here to the extent that he's trying to say anything there's this to that point there's this weirdly i don't want to say utopian but there's a weird sort of like efficiency and functionality to the police in this movie that resonates in a whole different context right now because for one thing there's the great sequence where they're in the meeting and they're all describing what they're doing and it's cutting to those scenes. And it's like arguably, I mean, it's one of the great procedural scenes in any movie ever made, partially because they're just so good at their jobs. So it's a pleasure to actually watch these guys do what they're doing. But the second thing to that point is how much of the sort of dramatic scenes, the argument between Mifune and his wife the, the sort of sequences where Aoki, the chauffeur, who's so memorable in this film, is breaking down in front of these cops. The, the idea, as I understand it, is that the police in Japan at this time were much more embedded in public life. So you get the feeling that you're watching a movie about a society that wants to function better, and yet you have this harrowing sequence in the, in the drug den at the end of the movie and realize that a huge swath, no matter how well things work you're still going to have a swath of people who are helpless and can't escape the circumstances that resulted from this terrible recent history. Well, I would say it's, it's more in a, well, not, let, to be clear that those people are, are screwed in fact, because of let's say capitalism, right? So like if there is a critique of the film, it would be of like the ways in which like these institutions, let's say are used for the benefit of those who they're supposed to support like you know the the wealthy like capitalist class right well i, I think also you know to, to that point about um the drug den at the end you know it's interesting that the cops try to kind of go into the drug den and i think eventually they do but but when they go into the drug den like everybody's like be careful there are like some strangers here there's some cops like like people immediately pick them out as right as as standing mm -hmm. out whereas in the hospital there's that great scene in the hospital where like it eventually you eventually realize that like every single person you're looking at is a cop <laughs> like the whole play, like, lobby in the, in the room they're all cops you know um takeuchi like starts to walk out and this guy's coming in with flowers he's a cop like they're all cops <laughs> um so i don't know it, it is in, it is interesting um, watching the film and 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 noting where the cops are able to kind of go in, mm -hmm. where they're welcome, where they're able to sort of blend in, and then where they're not. Well, there is that, yeah. Then it's towards the end, obviously, too, when they're where they're tailing him too, where the cops are in the car, and I forgot exactly where he goes, but they all look at each other in the car and like, oh, we don't we don't belong there. Like we don't we wouldn't fit in. Right. It might be into the drug then, but I'm not entirely sure. I think it's somewhere before the drug then. And it's just like this funny, like this interesting moment where they're like, oh no, we like, we would definitely be spotted. We you know, would, it's, like, we don't to that in. point, one of the things that I think this movie does really, really successfully is, and I think it's a little sad because I don't think it really worked out this way, is that there's the moment with the police where these two higher ups introduce Tokura, the inspector, played by Tatsuya Nakadai, and those two officers are played by Takashi Shimura and Susumu Fujita. Susumu Fujita being the first lead in a Kurosawa film with Sanchiro Sugata and Takashi Shimura being 
as important a part of this season as Mufune was, because you can't talk about Kurosawa and Mufune without talking about Shimura. And it just feels very specific to me in a meta sense that there's the sequence where the two sort of original leads of Kurosawa movies are introducing this guy who would play a formative part in the later part of his career. And I think it's just so interesting how this is such a different lead performance or you know protagonist-esque performance in this film because it feels as though kurosawa wants to make a movie about someone who's a little more grounded a little more together and who stands in contrast to mifune so and it feels very different from his performance in yojimbo and and um san what am, sanjuro so i'd love to hear what you guys think about Tatsuya Nakada in this performance. Apparently, it was modeled on Henry Fonda. I'm sorry, not Henry Fonda, Peter Fonda. Peter Fonda, because what comes up in the commentary track is that Mifune apparently told Nakada, like, I want you to do, I like, thinking about 12 Angry Men, I mm, want yeah. to see you do it. Like, a Peter Fonda is the inspiration. Huh, interesting. Well, that makes sense then, because Peter Fonda, I think at the time, was probably seen as, you know next man up you know um and that's that's kind of what's happening here it would have been interesting to see i mean uh, uh, you know obviously chris Allen continues to make films after this but his output slows down so much you know if he had continued to go even at the pace that he was at at this point um you know what kind of films would we have gotten i mean obviously nakadai comes back and, and and does other movies for him but you know it like, did he think that maybe he was going to kind of continue making more movies with this guy and he was going to maybe become the next Mifune in a way? Not not necessarily the next Mifune, but his next big star, you know? Yeah, I wonder about that a lot because obviously Mifune and Kurosawa part ways, you know, from what I, I mean, I think Galbraith gets into this in the book, partially around credit and money and, and what was expected of, you know, what, what Mifune thought he was worth. But also I think the Japanese film industry was changing and what Kurosawa was doing, these like big expensive movies was proving to be less popular than they had been, as I understand them. But there's a kind of softness to his performance and an expertise and like a, yeah. a caring that feels like a, it's coming from a guy who wants to make a different kind of movie potentially and it's hard not to read it as autobiographical huh autobiographical in what sense you mean well i guess it's more that i i view it as he's the the relationship between kurosawa's male leads and himself while maybe not autobiographical feels so intrinsic to what the movies are that it's interesting to oh. see sort of a there's a scene in this film where mifune says like i'm not going to give up my money because my work is who I am and that's how I define myself. And there's a way to read that as Kurosawa later in his career, let's say outside of his most, his most successful or most impossible to say most successful because every movie he made works really, really well, but he's probably not on the, the same level as he had been. He's now financing his own movies. He has his own production company. You know, it's interesting to read Mifune as an ex Mifune's performance in this film as an expression of some kind of autobiograph autobiography. And then there's this other character who's a little bit like chill, things are gonna work out, has a bit of a sense of humor, which I find really interesting. And it's interesting to view them in relationship to one another as different aspects of who Kurosawa was. Okay. Yeah. And it's interesting because right after this, I think M Mifune directs was it, is it Legend of the Five Hundred Thousand, mm -hmm. or, or um, which also has a, a, a moment of spot color in a black and white movie? So it, it's almost like he's trying to kind of take over the mantle right. of Kurosawa. And his interests failing. were shifting. I think at this point he'd started his own production company. I yeah. think he yeah. wanted to do more. I also think he's aging a little bit, and I, he probably yeah. I mean, I, I he think, also wanted to make a lot more money. I think I that's think really the, what also what it was. The Galbraith also said, like says that at this point in his career, he's also doing a lot more work internationally as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he, I think he only made about. I mean, who knows what this is, but about five thousand per picture in Japan. That's what it, yeah, which is interesting. And and being uh, on contract to Toho, I guess. Um, yeah, there are a lot of movies in with in which Mifune just like shows up briefly. Like it's not like it's not like the star system where it's like we have Mifune and now you know we are going to make a bunch of Mifune films. Like, oh yeah, where we have this movie, like have Mifune come in for five minutes, you know. Um, and that's 
I don't know, that probably allowed him to work more and maybe get paid more. But um, but I, I wonder if that was just frustrating um, as an actor to just kind of be tossed around like that, especially after you've become such a huge international pre figure at this point. You know? So interesting to hear, like, there's that story about how he was on set with, he went to visit Charlton Heston on set of some film, I forget what it was, and Charlton Heston was like, if that guy spoke English, he would be the biggest movie star in the world. And it, it I mean, I don't know if I feel bad for Mufune, but the idea of Mufune having been like this larger than life presence, and imagine, imagine if Toshiro Mufune were Charlton Heston, or Toshiro Mufune were in Star Wars, as Lucas yeah. so much wanted him to be. But... Yeah, I think there's an interesting, you know, parallel between their careers. I mean, I think it's well documented that Mifune and Kurosawa were never as successful as they were when they worked together, worked together in these yeah. films. Yeah. So, one, okay, this is a big question, so let's see how uh -oh, this goes. Here we go. But <laughs> one of the things that blows my mind about this movie is trying to think about what it's saying about let's say class or even about individualism as a whole. And Bill Gates, you kind of hit on this a little bit, but I think one, something that impresses me so much is that Kurosawa says things without anything in the film feeling as though it's a mouthpiece. In other words, and George, I'm curious because this came up in a text conversation we had about whether or not, you know, you mentioned like, oh, this film, you know, I don't know if I agree with what it has to say, but I think that that's one of the, great things about this movie is that it says many, many different things because it's much more of a visceral expression of, let's say, society than it is a movie with a statement. Um, do you guys well, feel like this? It's not didactic. What did you, yeah. it's not that, yeah. What did you come away with watching the film this time, especially as we think about issues of class now? Well, I think the, I mean, he's, he, he, manages to convey so much with just juxtaposition, right? I mean, the fact that, I mean, we, we've talked about this, obviously, but but the fact that, it you know, the, the, the film begins in, you know, the living room of that stately um, house on a hill, and so much of it takes place in that interior, and then we kind of make our way through um, Japanese society, um, and you get a sense of how isolated he is, how isolated Gondo is, um, and just how much everyone else is at kind of, you know, I mean, they're outside and, and often at the mercy of the elements, but also just they don't have any of the uh, the sort of insularity that he has. Um, and I think that's I think that's poignant. And I think I mean I, I mentioned Stray Dog, but it does feel like a replay of Stray Dog in that sense, in, in this kind of, you know the, the the cop looking you know for his gun going through kind of this like cross section of japanese society and getting a sense of what you know what things were like after the war um and i think that that you know and that kind of is kind of crystallized in that final scene with the way that kurosawa plays with the reflections mm -hmm. in the window um so that you know the, the two characters faces are superimposed um, and, and I think that's an interesting, you know, that's, that's very subtle, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, he's not like hammering you over the head with the reflections, but they're definitely there. Um, so someone who, you know, is into things like reading a movie, you know, that, that symbolism is there, but it's not, it's not like nobody's like, you know, making big speeches about right. it, you know, so that everyone... Um, everyone in the audience can understand. Well, but, um, but again, there is like, for example, again, going back to the screenplay, I'm sorry not to nitpick on this film, but there is like that oh, moment where, Jesus. where the cops are walking and they look at the house and like, hey, look at the house up on that hill. It's almost like it's looking down on us. <laughs> like, yeah, of course it is. Like the visuals tell you that. Like you don't have, like, or they could just look up and like, oh, like there's the house. You could see it from down here. Like again, there was one of those moments where I flagged. I was like, do we need that extra bit of dialogue, Kurosawa? Like you're usually so much more subtle than that, and of course I was just saying this to nobody on my couch, and nobody was there. Well, it's, 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 <laughs> that, that line doesn't bother me um, simply because it, it makes perfect sense that somebody would say that. Yes, you know it doesn't. It doesn't feel like a line that they're saying so that we get the point. It actually feels like a completely natural thing because I mean, to be fair, they found an amazing house, <laughs> yeah. uh, or I don't know if they. I mean, I don't know if they built all that, but like that's like I mean, such a. 
like that's that's what I was thinking when I mm -hmm. watched that exterior shot. I'm like, my God, that house is just like looming on that hill. Um, so it doesn't bother me in that sense. Um, and also it's kind of, I mean, it's, it, it, it's also interesting because the cops, it's important to establish that it feels that way for the cops too. You know, it's not just mm -hmm. um, the kidnap. It's not just the bad guy who who has this kind of, reaction to the house it's these cops who are after all trying to help that the guy that lives in that house get his money back yeah. um and also retrieve a, a young child <laughs> um but like it, it, it's like it, i think it's i think it's important for the film to acknowledge that the cops are themselves you know kind of part of this outside working class world yeah. well i think to that point there's you know <laughs> The, the easy parallel, there's a way to talk about this movie as like an ensemble drama in the sense that it, it covers a multitude of different characters having experiences. It doesn't like plunge into the lives of all those characters, but there's something when you watch a film like this that's made in like, you know, 1963 in Japan and you have the moments that like are a little cringy. One example of that is when they're all like, oh, Gondo's such a good guy. Like he's so great. You know what I mean? And like, it's easy, I think, to read it as in our modern contemporary reading is like, oh, like this ugh, millionaires, which is fine. I understand that. But I think that the movie, one of the things that makes the movie so, so, so good to me is the way it, it almost becomes a subversive look at class rage through the lens of a millionaire in the sense that we, we have his experience. And then we, as you pointed out, Bill Gay, we have this experience of watching a whole infrastructure try to, help him and meanwhile he's just out of frame he's mowing the lawn he's outside our point of view but every time we see him he's silent and he's quiet and he's a different person than he is at the beginning of the film and the moment that sticks out to me from the final scene which i think is amazing and interestingly this is a bit of a digression but it's interesting that this comes out in 63 and persona comes out in 66 just in terms of the way it it, it does this thing with the final images where we're trading between the two and we're they're meant to meld you know very different looks at kind of an identity kind of thing. But at the end, one of the most memorable lines that Mifune has is, why do we have to hate each other? Which mm -hmm. he says to the kidnapper, kidnapper, which I think is so compelling because it's like, well, we understand why the kidnapper hates you. Like, we understand that there's a problem in this society that you're a part of, and yet we also understand why there's... It grants Mifune a little more grace than maybe a less interesting movie would be because we both are sort of upset by the class dynamics, but also like sympathetic to him as an individual person in this larger infrastructure. Well, I think also, I mean, this is, you know, great directors have this uncanny ability to, no matter what their inspiration or their intent in making a film or tackling a certain subject, no matter how inane their own kind of initial impetus is, something great and complicated emerges. Like this whole thing about Kurosawa saying he wanted to make this movie because he thought the, you know, he thought the sentencing laws for kidnappers <laughs> so were, were too weird. lenient. I was like, really? So, so you made high and low? I made a two hour and 40 minute PSA about laws yeah. in Japan. I mean, sometimes you wonder if it's just them trolling the press or what, but it is funny how, like this is the, you know, he, he winds up making the most like complex humanistic, Mm -hmm. you know drama about kidnappers ever um and and his whole thing is yeah we really need to execute these guys <laughs> and then he has that final scene you know um but uh it is um i think that the, 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 i mean this is the kind of thing that happens when a great director tackles this sort of material because they're they're so observant and their mind works in such a way mm -hmm. and, and their artistry works in such a way that something beautiful emerges regardless of why they might have been initially interested in tackling the subject um but that line always strikes me you know the his why can't we get along line why must we hate mm -hmm. each other line i mean because it comes from i mean that's that's the cry of the privilege right like wh why can't why do we hate each other? Why would why why does anybody need to hate each other? Well, it's very easy for you to not want to mm -hmm. be hated um, because your situation is pretty good. Um, you know, you have the luxury of not having to hate or not having to argue or you know being able to just kind of 
turn off the world and turn off the injustices of the world. Um, and but at the same time, Kurosawa, I mean, Kurosawa isn't like, you know, Mr. Waving the red flag here. I mean, he is he is he is a capitalist to the core. He's a wealthy man. He's very successful at this point, mm -hmm. um, you know, and he's proud of his success. He's not um, I mean, he's not a, you know, socialist firebrand or anything like that. I think he maybe implicitly understands the um, the complexity and maybe even hypocrisy of Mifune's um, position in that final scene, but allows him to give voice to it in a, in a way that is sincere and, like you say, graceful as well. And that's part of why the movie is great, yeah. because you can have these really contradictory, opposing thoughts about that about a scene like that and kind of keep them in the air you know the movie's the movie's not there to answer questions for us yes you know it's actually a great example of uh art as you know question and uh, you know art not making a statement but instead proposing a series of like co increasingly complicated questions you know and, and yeah. i think it one of the things that i always come back to about Mifune and one or Kurosawa and Mifune, but particularly Kurosawa, is how he was present for these Toho strikes in the late 40s and early 1950s. And that he was clearly sort of like, I just want to make fucking movies. Like that was really yeah. who he was, is he wanted to make movies. And I I always wonder like how that shaped him as an as a as a person and as an artist. And I think you can even see the resonances of that in this film 13, 15 years later and you know with films like what's the um setsuko hara film uh no regrets for our youth you know he's clearly interested and concerned with some of these issues well yeah i think a lot of it also comes from him viewing himself as an auteur i mean i mean obviously that, that comes with the political and implications and whatnot but i i think yeah he's just kind of like hey i just want to fucking make my films i'm the director and i'm an artist and that's what i want to do mm-hmm yeah, I mean, in terms of the, um, you know, the, the the era in which he kind of came up as a filmmaker, as an assistant, and then a director, I mean, allegiances were were a very thorny thing in Japan mm -hmm. at the time. I mean, even in his, if I remember, I think it's in his autobiography when he just kind of matter of factly talks about how his he and his wife were, you know, kind of preparing to, you know, preparing to commit suicide if the, you know, if, if Japan law. I mean, and it's. And remember, this and it's not just them. I mean, it's like, you know, so much of the country was kind of preparing for this. And then he talks about kind of the relief he felt when, you know, when they were like, okay, no, no, we don't have to commit suicide. Okay, all right, well, glad that's over. I mean, it's kind of, it's insane. I mean, think about the kind of trauma that you, I mean, think about that kind of societal yeah. trauma and what happens in its wake. And... You know, in, in so many ways, even though Kurosawa maybe wouldn't have put it that way, you've got to you've got to consider the fact that so much of what he's ultimately making films about is really about a society that has gone through, you know, just the most yeah. unspeakable trauma ever, um, and all the different ways in which that manifests itself. You know, well into the '60s and '70s. I mean, into the '80s. You know, I may be misremembering. But I think there's a story in the Galbraith book around about him walking around Tokyo um, with and people had swords, people had yeah. knives because they were very, very ready to commit ritualistic suicide at the at the moment when it was announced that Japan had fallen. And, you know, it's also. Yeah. So that's very real. And I think that that's one of the great, you know, things we've learned from these films is their context within the moment that they were made and how important that is to understanding what they're about. Yeah. And the story, I mean, then also, I think with Mifune, I mean, the story, this is from the Galbraith book, but, you know, that at, at the end of the war, all he had was two blankets that he, you know, that he fashioned a suit out of. If you see this documentary, um, you know, Mifune, The Last Samurai, they actually show you the suit. You know, his mm -hmm. son kept it. Wow. Um, and it's, it's actually, I must say, a, a, a pretty impressive feat of sewing like it's like a real suit like yeah. it's like you know wow um but um but like the idea that you know here's a guy who had nothing um i think he did 
doesn't even know what happened to his parents. I mean, they died in the war, but nobody really knows where or when or how. Um, and, you know, got nothing to lose, doesn't even want to be an actor, but kind of winds mm -hmm. up being an actor through a, a variety of chance occurrences. I mean, that that is also part of the Mifune story and is seeps into a character like Gondo, which is why, you know, the face-off, his face-offs with, you know, those less fortunate than him in these movies is very poignant. Um, you know, it was very much a there but for the grace of God go I kind of situation, you know. Um, and I think that's part of, you know, part of his star appeal is he does bring that quality to it, even if he's not necessarily stating it outright as a character. I think we could talk about this movie for like three more hours. <laughs> I think we covered so everything gonna, there is to talk about. This. <laughs> What'd you say? There's nothing. No, we can't possibly continue. Yeah, there's not much else yeah. going on. Um, I think we can wrap wrap it up there. Uh, Bill Gate, th thank you so much for thank joining you, Bilge, us yeah. for this. It was it was great and worthy of the movie, which everyone should go and see if they have not. See it now. Thank you. No, this was great. Uh, next. I, 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 uh, the, the only thing I wanted to mention please, is please. also the score, <gasps> yeah. which is amazing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's like, it's like you know, what if a, a movie was scored by an electrified fence, basically? Um, and uh, But also it reminded me of The Birds, huh. the score oh. for The Birds, which is also comes out the same year. So maybe it's a 60s thing. But then it made me think, oh, wait, you know, like Hitchcock, there is probably some Hitchcock in this movie as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, especially those early scenes, like, had Kurosawa seen a rope? Because it's very rope-like, wow. that opening, you know, section, you know? Um, anyway, that was just well, an Is, is there a particular moment that where the score, like, really um, just does some you magical things No, I don't even know, because, I, I, because it's such a strange score that there are no moments where it's like, you know, the score comes through. Mm -hmm. It's it's all just, like, it's all just, you know, kind of atonal, weird yeah. noises. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, sometimes punctuating, sometimes not. It's just such a eerie... It's like the cityscape has come to life, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think also one thing that, that you're drawing attention to that, that we probably haven't talked about enough, maybe we have, is how Kurosawa was one of the original great film geeks. Like, yeah. you know, he just loves John Ford. He loves these Westerns. He's he's absorbing things at a rate. He you won't know, stop tweeting about the Justice you know, League <laughs> movie. <laughs> there's, there's, there's sort of the, the internal criticism in Japan that's like, well, Kurosawa was too Western. His ideas were too Western. He was too influenced by the West. But, like, he's also a guy that, like, you feel like probably, like, Scorsese a little bit, watches yeah. everything and wants wants to get in everything. And, and yeah, I mean... It's, it's an interesting sort of him as cultural. I wish we had more of his takes. Well, that story, I think Sidney Lumet tells about how, you know, he, you know, Kurosawa arrives in New York or something in the, I guess, early 80s or, or for some trip. And the first thing he wants to do is go see Prince of the City, um, which I think <laughs> Lumet is, was always very uh, fond of talking about that because obviously Prince of the City was kind of a flop. But he's like, hey, you know what? Oh yeah, right. Kurosawa the, liked it. Put that on the tombstone. Are you kidding? It's, yeah. like, it's like how George brought this up. How um, was it? Leone yeah. was so excited by the letter that he wrote that was like, "You owe me money." Right. That <laughs> just well, because he said people. like, "Yeah." The Galbraith talks about there. He says like, "Hey, you made a yeah. good film, but you owe me money." And Leone was like, "Yeah." Oh. It's like this long list of demands, yeah. and Leone's like, "Kurosawa wrote me." <laughs> he liked my film. It is so. I'm being sued. Such, he would have. He would have had it. He would have been a great uh, film Twitter guy. Oh my God! Yeah. Tons of hot takes. Oh, we missed yeah. it. Oh God! <laughs> Listen yeah. to the three of us. We conclude this conversation <laughs> with. We just we just ruined the entire I podcast. Wish Kurosawa <laughs> was on Twitter. Well, the best thing about it is we could edit it out. <laughs> no, it's yeah. no. Everyone needs to know what we've done. Yeah, um, it's the, Akira Kurosawa. He would have been like one of Edgar Wright's reply guys. Yeah. <laughs> well, we have one episode left in this season, and it's on Redbeard. And I'm very excited. I've never seen that film, so I'm very, yeah, very excited to talk about oh. it. I'm assuming yeah. it's a black and white, but the, his beard is colored red. Red, yeah, his yeah, beard is a, in it's a conceit. <laughs> for the entire three hours. Looking hour forward to time. it. Um, we after that we're gonna talk we're gonna take a break and then we're gonna talk about um, Warren Beatty. We're gonna do a season on Warren Beatty. So Bill Gay, maybe you can come back and join us for a, a Warren Beatty film of your choice. Do you have a favorite? 
You mean Warren Beatty as a director or just Warren Beatty in general? Oh, just just any, Warren Beatty yeah. in general. Oh, gosh. Um, I mean, I love Reds. Yeah. I, I, I love Reds to death. But, you know, McCabe and Mrs. Miller, uh, you know, I mean, he made some good ones. He really, really, yeah. Unbelievable, actually. I was looking. It's not that many no. either. That's the craziest thing, which is why he's manageable after the gargantuan <laughs> season we've just committed ourselves to. Um, I think that's it, George. We got a new review um, from, a, from a guy named Blake in Australia. So I think it's our friend Blake oh, Howard yeah. taking the time to review the show and say Australia's say thanks, filled with so Blakes. You, Blake. I've been to Australia, so I know it's a continent filled with Blakes. So who There's knows? There's many Blakes. Um, please, if you have a chance, rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Uh, Bill, do you have anything you want to plug? Oh, yeah. Um, nothing Your Twitter, perhaps? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I... Well, I mean, people can find me on Twitter. Uh, anything I write, I tweet multiple times. So, you know, that's probably the best way to find it. But nothing, nothing I want to plug right now. Um, anything that you've seen recently that blew your mind? Other than High and Low, again, for like... Uh, <laughs> I saw this Kurosawa film. Well, my my review of Barb and Star go to Vista del Mar is about is dropping in about thirty minutes, um, and I, I'm not going to pretend like that movie blew my mind, but it is a you know <laughs> it is a delightful stoner comedy, and I was quite not quite expecting it to be as weird as it was. Um, um, but, yeah. I have been staring at the twenty dollar price tag for News of the World for three weeks. Oh, because that's right. Yeah, I love. Paul Greengrass very very much and I think his him with Tom Hanks is really good but I haven't been able to pull the trigger is it worth $20 it is worth it it's a great movie okay. it really is no it really is and I've seen it several times now um and I interviewed Greengrass about it I think it's a really I think it's a terrific movie and um it, it was I think on my top 20 of the year i don't think it was quite top wow. 10 i think it was like number 11 or 12 or something like that um but having watched it several times i i, I think it maybe it should have been in the top 10 i mean it's a great movie it really is um and it's a very it's a very interesting paul greengrass movie like he doesn't do the shaky cam stuff which everyone has noted um but mm. it does have a, a lot of ideas in it that have kind of run through his career have you watched, I, I mentioned, I, I, this is a complete digression, but first of all, I didn't know you interviewed him, so I want to find that. That sounds great. But the second is, have you listened to his um, David Lean lecture? No, he sent it to me um, because oh, yeah. we talked about David Lean in the interview. And in fact, there was a part where he talked about, well, there was a part where he said, you know, it's all in my David Lean lecture. Here, I'll email it to you. So he emailed it to me. Um, but uh no, he's a he's a very thoughtful um, guy and has a lot of interesting ideas and is very you know it it, it was touching hearing him talk about you know the cinemas of his youth and and mm -hmm. you know really getting into films at a young age. His dad was a huge David Lean fan, which which I, and, you know he talks about in his in his lecture. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think you'll I think you'll really like News of the World. I love his movies. And that lecture, if you can't find it, I still have the audio when they posted it because it's hard to find now. But it's he talks about Kurosawa actually a little bit and it's it's incredibly moving. It's one of the best sort of it's one of the best sort of confessional pieces about cinema I've ever I've ever listened to. So definitely cool. worth checking out. And I will check out that interview and I will watch News of the World. Now I feel justified <laughs> spending twenty dollars on him. Um I was Liam Billingham. I was George Rogopoulos. Bill Gabriel. <laughs> 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 and this was Oovra Buster. Thanks, everybody. George, you're unusually quiet. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>